Topic Video 3D Assembly Language using it. The focus of this topic is to have a look at how you can write assembly code in such a fashion that it is extremely readable, that anyone can pick up your code, read it, and have a good idea of what it's actually doing without really needing to know the nitty-gritty nitty of the mnemonics and so forth that you're using. So the focus here is on documentation within the code itself. So when it comes to structured assembly programming, basically we want to try and document our code as much as possible. So one of the key elements that we normally stick inside our assembly code is we normally give it a program header. So we normally give it a, a block at the top of your code that sort of describes exactly what it is that the that chunk of code actually does. So it basically describes the overall I guess picture of what the code is actually supposed to be doing. So it should briefly explain what the program does. It should contain the author's name so that way you can know who to blame if it doesn't work or you can know who to contact if you want to know how know some more detail about the code. Um, it should also refer to any um, dates and revisions. So if it's you know, a particular date that you wrote this code and then of course you include it there because you might be looking for a chunk of code that you wrote on a different date or a chunk of code that's of a different version. So the whole idea here is that the program header should describe enough about the code so that if you open up the text file you can look at the top and say yes or no very quickly whether in fact that's the piece of code that you're looking for. Okay, So that sort of makes it a bit easier for you to track down a certain chunk of code that you might be looking for. So I've given here an example of a program header so I'll give a brief description of what the program header was. So of course I've named the program. I've then described in very simple terms what the program basically does. I've then written here what the source file is. So in case maybe I've renamed the file since I wrote this code, so therefore this will have the name of the original source file, given the author's name, the date in which I created it, and any modifications that I may have made since originally writing it. So therefore I can see that if I've written the code and it worked and then I've made some modifications and now it doesn't work, at least the modifications are listed here so I know how to reverse my code back to its previous working state if I have to do that. The next sort of section that we have in our program is of course our assembler equates. So the whole idea of these equates is to try and make our code a lot more readable. So we basically try and label all our magic numbers so that way when we have write our code, we simply have labels in our code and no magic numbers. So that way it makes our code a lot more readable because we're seeing you know, descriptive names instead of numbers that really don't mean much unless you go look it up in the data sheet or you try and um, look it up or you've got a really good idea about what's actually happening. So try and remove all the magic numbers by using equates. So sort of equates that we can have, we can have system equates such as any monitor routines or I ports that we might have access to on our controller any constants equates so any constants that we might be using inside our program we can make them as equates that way they're included in the top section of our code any memory map equates so if we've got our RAM and our um, you know, our ROM in certain locations we might want to define the equates to where they start and maybe how long they are and so forth the beauty of using the equates is that you can simply have a label at the top of your code and you can reuse that label throughout your code and therefore if you want to change that value of that label you simply just have to change it in one spot. You don't have to go all the way through the code hunting for the different locations where you've used it and I guess if, if the number is common with some other number in your code you could in fact accidentally change the wrong number. So it's always good to try and use equates and that way you can very easily and quickly change your code if it needs to be changed. So the other, other benefit is if you're using um, IO equates and you want to change the particular port that you might be using, you simply got to just change the, the value next to that port reference in the equates instead of going through the code and finding each possible location where it pops up. The next section of your code is your variable section. So normally this contains any of the, I guess, the byte or word sized elements that you want to have to contain any variables that you might be using inside your code. Generally this section will be preceded by an org statement that will point the compiler to your RAM, so basically, well, sorry, point the assembler to your RAM, so it will tell 
the assembler, I want you to put these variables in this RAM location. So as far as we're concerned, there'll be an org RAM start line, and then under the org RAM start line is where you can define all your variables using a ds.b or ds.w sort of suit, um, assembler directive. So after the variable section, you normally have a program location. So normally we have an org line that will mention the start of our um, ROM section. So in our case, it points to the start of our flash. And after the, that program location line, then we effectively have our program initialization routine. So normally we have our entry line and we'll have the various pieces of code that we require to turn on our microcontroller to do the various aspects or turn on the various subsystems that we actually require to use throughout our code. Then after that we'll have our main program body, so we'll have a main loop or our main, I guess the main purpose of our program will actually be included next as a series of um, similar mnemonics. And then of course after our code we'll then have our constants that <coughs> will not change throughout the entire life of our program. So our constants are usually tagged on the end of our program. We don't put them on the front, we put them on the end, because if you put them on the front, they in fact pad out the front of the start of our code, and therefore you've got to change your entry point. If you put them on the end of your program, they just go on the end, they don't offset the code in any way, so it's always best to put your constants at the end of your program, and then, of course, after your constants, we actually put our vector table. <coughs> More on the vector table later on when we talk about interrupt um, subsystems. So to give you an example of some structured assembly programming, this is the, the I guess, the, the very basic chunk of code that you will start with in the labs. And we basically have a header block that tells us exactly what it is that the program does. We then have our um, assembler directives which sort of tell us where our program is going to start. So we have some exported um, assembler commands so that they tell the assembler where our, I guess, our main entry point is for our code. We then have some assembler equates so we have the include mc9s x, mc9s 12 xdp 512.inc that will include all the mappings for our various IO registers so you can simply use the name port A or port B and it will make the mapping to the particular memory location for you so that's already included as part of so there's a big chunk of assembler equates that allow us to make our code a lot more easy to read. We then have another um, assembler equate which is the ROM start which tells the assembler where our ROM actually starts and in this case it points to our flash We then have an org RAM start, which defines the start of our RAM space. So this basically defines the start of our, our variable space where we can stick our variables. So underneath that org RAM start and before the org ROM start, so in, in between those two org lines, that is where we can put our variables. So our variables can go on that section. We can define them using ds.bs or ds.ws, depending on whether they're 8 or 16 bit in length. And then we then have our program start, which is our org ROM start, which defines the, that every piece of instruction after this should actually be assembled into our ROM. We then have program initialization, which sets up our stack pointer, turns on our interrupts, and then we have our main loop, which is our main body. So we stick our program code in the main body section. And then there are no constants in this example, so the constants would go after the spin line. And the last thing in this example is we actually have our interrupt vectors or our vector table. But we'll talk a bit, bit more about that later. But for now, you need that very basic vector table for your code to work. Of course, the focus on structured assembly code is basically on readability. We want to be able to make this code as readable as possible so that someone who has no idea about assembler can actually just look at your code, have a read of it, and get the gist of what's happening. So generally when it comes to doing structured assembly program, we try to do some sort of um, system analysis and design beforehand so we get a good idea of what we actually want to do in our programming. So we try and put our comments in. So when you've done your system analysis and design, so when you've done your flowcharts, you'll have these little blocks in your flowcharts that will tell you um, what each little step in your program needs to do. We well, take those little blocks in your flowchart, 
and you turn them into comments in your assembler code. And then you simply put the instructions or the, the actual means of implementing that comment as mnemonics and operands underneath that comment. So to give you an example here, I've given enable port A with 0 to 3 for input and 4 to 7 for output. And then I've simply got the um, instruction line to actually implement that comment. So using the move B, I can actually turn on the lower four bits for input and the higher four bits for output. So with higher level languages such as C, program flow is generally defined using various structures such as functions. So we can have little functions that can, little chunks of code that we can run independently or run repetitively at different times. We've got um, while repeat until structures, so we can do iterative structures as long as a particular condition is met. We can repeat a chunk of code. We've also got iterative structures where we can repeat a chunk of code for a certain number of times, and this is our for loop. And then, of course, we have conditional um, checks as well. We have our, then have our if-then-else structures as well. So you're probably very familiar, if you've done any program whatsoever before, you're very familiar with the sort of concept of these different program flow structures. So how do we go about implementing this in assembler? Well, when it comes to implementing functions, functions are generally referred to as subroutines in assembly. And a subroutine consists of a series of instructions terminated by an RTS instruction. So it's just a sequential um, chunk of um, um, sequential chunk of mnemonics which simply is terminated by an RTS. So it's like normal code, but the end of this subroutine is just flagged by an RTS instruction. And of course, when you want to call the subroutine, you simply use a JSR. So like I said before, when you want to jump to a subroutine, you use the JSR command. Okay, and when you call the JSR command, it effectively puts the current program counter value onto the stack. And then it will then simply put the location of that subroutine onto the program counter, which effectively makes the microprocessor run that subroutine, start running the subroutine. And then when you start running the subroutine, you can run through all the different instructions inside that subroutine. You get all the way down to the end where there's the RTS. When you hit the RTS, the RTS causes the microprocessor to extract 16 bits off the stack and put those 16 bits into the program counter. So as long as you've maintained that stack inside that subroutine, as long as you've ensured every push has the corresponding pull, so you ensure that the stack pointer refers to exactly the same position it was pointing to when you entered that subroutine, then of course the two bytes that you pull off the stack when you do the RTS will be that program counter value that you pushed on there when you ran the JSR. So as long as you've preserved the stack, then your program will in fact bounce back to the line after the JSR. So therefore it will simply jump back to the original chunk of code that called it and continue executing the next instruction under the JSR. So it's very important that JSR and RTS are a matched pair. If you JSR somewhere, you've got an RTS back. If you branch somewhere, you've got a branch back. So it's very important to, to ensure that every time you JSR, you RTS, and you can't RTS unless, of course, you've JSR'd to get there. OK, so generally when we write our subroutines, we want, like to give some sort of description about what's happening with the subroutines because the ultimate goal here is not to rewrite code over and over and over again, but we try to reuse as much code as we possibly can. So we try to make our subroutines independent, we try to make them very descriptive, and we try to give them a little bit extra information. So we like to try to give a little program header block for each one of our little subroutines. So we basically put a, a function header before each one of our subroutines, which consists of a title, a description, sort of says exactly what it does, any inputs and outputs, that it might require, so any inputs that it requires, and generally with a similar program when it comes to inputs, you might say, you know, um, input is particular value passed through accumulator A, B, or D. So you might actually use accumulators to pass the variables into these subroutines. And then, of course, you can then specify the outputs, where the outputs come back through. So the outputs may be a certain value, so you describe what that value is, and you describe where it's being passed back through. So it might be, might be being passed back through accumulator B, A, or D. And then, of course, you specify the author, sorry, the author, the date, and, of course, the revision of that subroutine.
So I've given here an example of a function. So this is the flowchart of a particular function. So we simply have our begin terminal block. We then have a predefined task block. So this is like our subroutine to say, hey, this chunk of code is defined in a bit more detail later on. So we have this sort of rectangular block with the lines on either end. And then we have the end. So this is a very simple program that simply runs the subroutine called init SCI. There's no inputs, there's no outputs, so they're defined in the calling there is simply um, empty. So they're empty next to the in, empty next to the out, so there's no inputs or outputs. Okay, and then of course I've got the subroutine itself as a flowchart. In, in the beginning terminal block, I've actually defined the name, so therefore it's easy to track down exactly where the flowchart is. And then I've got the various blocks that implement the various functions that this subroutine should do and then I get down to the end block on the end of the subroutine. So when I was translating, the, when this is translated to assembler code, the predefined task, so when you're translating that, the, the first flowchart on the left, when you get to the init SCI predefined block, you'd simply tr translate that to a JSR. So that would be your jump to subroutine. And then when you did the flowchart on the right, the actual subroutine itself, you'd simply translate all those instructions one by one and then when you got to the end the end would be substituted with an RTS okay because when when you actually ran through this flowchart when you get to the predefined block you jump over to the flowchart on the right and then you go through them step by step and when you get to the end you jump back to the next block under where you where the init SCI is so you'd simply jump back so that effectively when you s translate it to assembly code the end block in the subroutine would be translated to an RTS Okay, so when it came to doing a subroutine, you'd actually need to describe the, the subroutine block and give it a bit of detail exactly as to what happens. So I've given an example here. This is a very cut down version of the init, init SEI, the full version is available on the web. But basically I've just given a header block to define exactly what's happening. I've said what the inputs are, there's no inputs, outputs are, no outputs, who the author is, when it was written, revision version, and then of course the name, of the subroutine in the SCI, so I'll give it the label because that's what I want to use in the JSR to jump to that particular routine. And then I've got the various instructions and then I've terminated it with an RTS. <coughs> so another, another one of the structures that we use quite frequently inside Assembler is of course a, a while do structure. So when it comes to C syntax, um, a while Structure is simply using the while keyword and then we give it the condition in the brackets and then we use the curly braces to make a compound statement to, to define what chunk of code we actually need to keep repeating while that particular condition is true. Okay, I've shown on the right there a flowchart of a while structure. So simply with the while structure we're simply doing our check first. So we check if A is equal to 10 if it is equal to 10, then we end. If it's not equal to 10, so it's false, we simply do something. So we keep doing that. And then the second that A is equal to 10, okay, we simply end. Because obviously if I is less than 10, we keep doing it. So the, so the, the actual ending condition of that while loop is in fact when I is equal to 10. Or greater than 10, I guess. So you can make it make that condition A is equal to 10 or A is greater than 10, but if you're incrementing A by one at a time, then A equals 10 is sufficient. So it depends on how you're incrementing that variable to what sort of condition you put there in its place. So when it comes to doing the same thing in assembler, we simply have a compare A statement. So we compare A with a particular value and we branch if, if it's equal to the end. Okay. If it's not equal, then of course we keep doing the instructions under it. So therefore when we get back to the bottom, of those repetitive instructions, we hit the branch always, and we branch always back up to loop. And we can continually keep looping back up to loop, and then we do the check each time. And the second that that value of A is equal to 10, then we simply exit. Repeat until structures are very similar to while do structures, except when we actually check the condition. So we need to check the condition um, after we actually do those repetitive instructions. So we at least do the instructions once, then we check. Whereas when in a while condition, we check the condition first, and if the condition is 
false, then we never do the, the, the block of instructions that, that, that we actually want to repeat. As what, except for when we do a repeat until, we at least to do those instructions once, then we check. So that's the difference between a repeat until and a while is whether you in fact want to check the condition at the beginning or at the end. So when it comes to doing a repeat until, if you look at the flow chart, we simply have a repeat until, we simply do something, then we do our check, and then we end. So we do something, if A is greater than 10, true, then we end. If it's not greater than 10, then we simply go back and do something. So this is the same sort of condition as before, but we're doing it using a repeat until structure. So when we do it in assembler, there's a lot less branches, but it depends purely on the application, whether you need to check the condition first or after, you at least do it once. So in this condition here, in this um, assembly code here, we actually run through the block that we actually want to do. So that's what the dot dot dots represent, the code that we want to actually repeat. Then we compare our accumulator A if it's 10. If it's not equal to, okay, then we simply branch back to loop. So if it's actually not equal to 10, we branch back to loop and we keep repeating. Okay, the second it is equal to 10, we simply stop that while loop and continue on down to the next instruction under under the um, BNE command. For loop structures are very good for doing iterative statements uh, a predefined number of times. So whether we know that number of times at run at compile time or assemble time or whether we grab it from a variable and we do it a variable number of times, but for loops are very good for doing iterative statements, you know, a predefined number of times. So when it comes to doing a for loop, for loop generally has three stages. It has initialization stage, a stage where we actually initialize a loop counter to be some sort of value. And then we have uh, the second stage, which is a conditional stage. So we actually check to see if a condition is met. If the condition is true, we keep repeating. If the condition is not true, we exit. And then the third stage, of course, is our incremental stage of our counter, whether we're incrementing it, decrementing it, how much we're incrementing or decrementing by. So Generally, a for loop has three stages. And each of these three stages are actually shown in this flow chart. On the right, we see that we initialize our loop counter to be B. We initialize it to be 10, so we want to do this 10 times. So we need to do these statements 10 times. Then we simply do something. We then decrement our loop counter, so it's B equals B minus 1. And then we check to see if B is equal to 0, or not equal to 0. If it is equal to, if it is not equal to zero, then we simply go back and we keep repeating it. If it is in fact equal to zero, then we simply end. Okay, so there's repetition there. So we simply set our value to be 10. We go down, we do something, we decrement b by one. So therefore, b is now equal to nine. We go back, now b is not equal to zero. So we go back up, we do something again, then we decrement it down to eight. And we keep repeating this until, of course, b is equal to zero. Once b is equal to zero, then we simply exit that looping structure. So I've shown this in assembly code. We simply load our accumulator B with a value of 10. We then have a label called loop. We then, using a DBNE command, we simply decrement the variable B by one. And then if it's not equal to zero, we simply go back to the loop. So using a DBNE command, it does both the B equals B minus one and the B is not equal to zero portions. If then else structures, we can do if then else structures simply by using compares. So these diamonds in our flowcharts are simply replaced by uh, two commands, a compare and then a branch instruction, depending on what sort of condition we're actually looking for. So the actual value that we're comparing against is generally put into a compare statement. So in this case, B equals 10. So therefore the value of 10 will be put into a compare. And then we will pick a branching command to represent the logical <coughs> to represent the logical operator that we want to use here. So in this case it's B equals 10, so therefore the branching command we're going to use it will be branch of equal. Or depending if you want to do the false or the true parts, we may in fact use branch of equal or branch of not equal, depending on which way we want to branch, whether it's true or branch whether it's false. Because ultimately we need one of them to jump over a chunk of jump jump over that chunk of code. So we're generally after the branch of branch command will have the, either the true or the false chunk of code and then somewhere further down we'll have the other portion whether it's the false or true but we'll have two I guess two sequential chunks inside our assembly code one for the true statement one for the false statement so we need to actually use branching commands to branch 
around those bits of code depending on which, you know, whether that condition is true or false. So when it comes to some of the flowchart, we have the diamond, we have the true path, we have the false path. So we have two different things we need to do. And then after we do those two things, we then need to combine back into the same sort of... They both have to meet up at the same instruction at the end. So I'll give an example here on the, on the left in, in assembly code. So we have our compare B. So we compare B with 10 because that's the value we're comparing against. Then we use a branch of equal command because it's the equal equal operator, so we actually want to check the equals condition, so we're using the branching equals, which is the branching command to check if it's equals. Then if, in fact, it is equal, we branch to then, which means we skip over the else code and jump down to the then code. We then, underneath the branch equal, we have the else code that we want to run, so we simply run our else code. When we get to the bottom of the else code, we branch to the end, which means we then skip over the true portion of the code, and then... We have underneath that else bit, we then have the true portion of the code, the then portion of code, and you'll see that the then portion of code then ends at that end label, which is the same location where the else branches to when it's actually finished. So you have both paths ending up at the end label when they've completed. And of course, there's situations where we want to do like a switch like statement where we have a series of if then else cascaded if then else statements so unlike C we don't have a lovely little structure to do this for us automatically we basically have to make a series of cascaded um, if then else statements so I've given the flowchart on the right and we simply check if B is less than 10 if it is we do this if B is equal to 10 we do this if B is greater than 20 we do this otherwise we do the ch chunk on the end so we've got series of labels to actually define our path so we do our first check if b is less than 10 if it's not we then go down to check 2 we do b is equal to 10 if it's not we go down to check 3 which is b is less than 20 if it's not we go to else and we all end up at the end if so it doesn't matter which sort of chunk of code meets that condition which chunk of code we actually run they will all end up down at the end if label so you can see the assembly code on the left, we simply compare B with 10. If it's greater than, we jump to check 2, which means we have skipped over the true code. So then we do the, then do this chunk if, if, if in fact it was um, less than 10. We then, when we finish that true code, we branch down to end if. We then do our check 2. So if in fact our value was in fact equal to or greater than 10, then we've jumped down to check 2. So check 2 has got another comparison again. We compare against 10 again because that's the value on the on the left of that, sorry, on the right of that comparison. So we check the value of 10 again, we branch not equal, so therefore it means we skip over the true code and go down to the check number three. We then check number three, compare it against 20. If it's less than or equal to, we jump down to else. Okay, so we skip over the true code. So each one of these checks simply causes it to skip over the, the, the true code, which is directly under the branch. So that's one way of doing it. Or you could do the opposite way, which is simply Branching if it is true and you have the true code somewhere else in the um, in the assembly code somewhere. <coughs> so when it comes to defining data and data types in assembler, you've really only got you know, three basic types that you can define. They can either be bytes, words, or longs, but generally bytes and words are the limit of what we actually define. So when it comes to, to data and assembly programs, the data can be defined in two ways. It can either be considered a constant, which means it means it never changes, or it can be considered a variable, which means it will change during the program time. So as I said, a constant cannot be altered during normal operation, So and it remains a constant throughout the whole life of the program. So you simply define it in your code, it never changes. Okay, so a constant might be like a string that you print to the screen, and you never want to change that string. So you Make it a constant, you'll stick it in the, in the memory at the end of your program, which is read-only memory, so therefore it will not change during the program life anyway. So it's a combination of two, of two things. One is you need to see whether, of course, your data needs to change or whether it can remain constant. So you need to make the decision whether, of course, it's a variable or it's data. And then the second thing is you need to then put it in the appropriate memory location to ensure that it does stay a constant or a variable. So if you put it in RAM space, then it will be a variable. If you put it in ROM space, it will be a constant. <coughs>
Okay, so, so <coughs> basically when you define them, you define them to be spe their specific size. So you can define them using um, a dc.b to define a constant, or you can do a ds.b to define a variable. So there's the assembler directive that you use also to define whether it's a variable or whether it's a constant. And then, of course, it also depends on where you store that value as well, whether you store it in RAM or ROM as to whether it's a variable or constant. So constants are defined using a DC assembler directive, and they're put in ROM, okay? And they're generally put in ROM after your code, okay, at the bottom of your code. Variables, on the other hand, are defined using a DC.B or using a DCS command, okay? And they're generally put inside our RAM region of memory. So therefore, when they're in RAM, they can actually be modified during the life of the program. So I've given you an example here of a string constant example. So I've given it a label name. Use the dc.b. And then inside inverted commas, I've actually got a string called Timmy. So what happens is the assembler will actually go and translate all those characters into their ASCII equivalent and store them in the memory location that name refers to. So it'll be in the five memory locations with the first memory location being referred to by name. <laughs> I've then got a variable here called data that I've defined using a DS, so it's a byte size, so if you don't specify the size, it's defaults to byte. So I've got a single byte variable called data, and I've put it in an org RAM start. So org RAM start defines our RAM. I've then got a variable called data, which is one byte in size. So it requires you to put it in the right location, whether it's RAM or ROM, depending on whether it's variable or constant, and also using the right assembler directive to define that particular element as well. So to give you an example of defining some constants, I've given here a string. You can define a string simply by using a dc.b command and putting the string that you want to define inside inverted commas. So by putting them in inverted commas, the, ass the assembler will do all the hard work for you of translating them into their ASCII character equivalents. If you want to define an 8-bit constant, you can define that using many different forms. So here I've given an example of a variable called delay, or sorry, a constant called delay, and that constant I can define as either decimal, octal, or hexadecimal. So it depends on which form is easiest, so which one is the less work f for you. So whichever form you've originally got it in, whether it's decimal, simply use it in decimal. If you get out of a data sheet and it's in hexadecimal, then simply use it in hexadecimal. So you don't really want to introduce any more errors due to conversion or translation. <coughs> Excuse me. We then have a 16-bit constant. So when it comes to defining a 16-bit constant, you can define that also in numerous ways as well. You can define it as two individual bytes. So you can define it as the MSB and the LSB, or you can define it as a comma separated string of bytes or you can simply define it as a word with a single value. So it depends on which form is easier, which will whichever form is easiest for you to read and understand, that's the form you generally use. So the whole idea here is try and make your code as readable as possible. So try and leave you know values in their original form as you might get them out of a data sheet. So to give you an example of a string example, so this is an example code that actually prints a string out. So inside our main loop, we simply JSR to init SCI, so we simply turn on the serial port, so we turn on our um, serial subsystem so that we can echo some stuff out to the screen. We load our X index register with the memory location of string, okay? And then inside an iterative loop, we simply step through that string, printing each character out at a time. So how do we do that? We're simply using index addressing. We simply load the value that x points to into accumulator b. We compare that to see if it's a zero, because we're using null terminated strings here. If it's not, we simply, or sorry, if it is equal to zero, we simply branch down a spin, which means we've stopped printing the string. But if it's not equal to zero, then we continue on to the next instruction, which means we get to the put char. We put that character out to the screen. So put char is a subroutine that simply prints whatever value is in accumulator B to the screen. So it assumes that the value in accumulator B is an ASCII character of some kind. So if you give it the number zero and you go to run put char, it'll print nothing on the screen. So it'll actually print the null 
character on the screen. So if you want to print numbers, then you've actually got to convert them to their equivalent um, ASCII representation. So put char will simply print a character out to the screen. After we do the put char, we simply increment x to point to the next character in that string. We then branch back to loop, which means we actually load the next character into accumulator B. We compare to see if it's zero, and we repeat the whole process over and over and over and over again. So we simply go through that string one character at a time, printing that character to the screen until we hit the null terminating character on the end of the string. So until we hit the zero character or zero on the string, then we simply stop printing the string. So we're simply using that magic number of zero to be our end point um, definition for our string. And this is a standard way that strings are represented inside C. They're actually null terminated strings. So, <coughs> so after we've actually run that code and we've gone down to spin, spin causes the spin on the spot so our code doesn't go any further, it doesn't start running random instructions, it simply stops at that point. So our program never actually gets after the spin, but what we've got after the spin is we've got actually assembler directives. So we've got an assembler directive that tells the assembler the base address for our serial port, and then we've got it including our serial subroutine, so we've included serial.inc, so therefore when we assemble this, all the entire contents of serial.inc is actually included after, or actually inclu included in place of this include line here. And then at the end of all those um, serial instructions, we simply then have our string definition. So we've got a string label, we've got a dc.b, and then we've defined the, the string hello world, and then we've put a zero on the end of it to null terminate it. So when it comes to defining variables or arrays for that matter, we define them all inside our RAM. So therefore each one of these examples has an org RAM start to define it as a variable. So we have an org RAM start and then we have a, a variable called single, which we define to be one byte in size. So it's single DS1. We've then got a double, which we go double DS2. So therefore we've got two bytes defined. We've got an, an example here of an array. So if you want to make an array of say 20 bytes in size, then we have the label name, in this case I've called it array, then have the assembler directive ds, and then I specify the size of the array, which in this case is 20 bytes. Okay. When it comes to accessing that array, I can access it either directly, so I can simply do an LDA array, or if I want to make it look very similar to C-like definition, whereas I simply use indexes into that particular array, I can simply load the X register with the memory location of array. So I simply have X containing the value, basically the location of the first element of that array. And then I can use indexed register, so indexed addressing to simply pick out particular elements of that array. So I can use an LDA0X and that's going to load the first element in that array. Because an LDA1X that will load the first the second element. I can use LD I can use SDAA 19 comma X, which means it'll save to the 19th element of that array or the last element of that array. So one thing you've got to be careful here is that there's no error checking. So you can actually step over the end of the end of the arrays and no one's really going to care. Okay, so there's no seg fault when you exceed a memory or, or an array here. It's simply going to write to the next variable. So it's very careful. You've got to be very careful that you keep track of the size of your structures. Another example of constants, so to speak, is pre-initialized arrays. And we generally refer to these pre-initialized arrays as lookup tables because effectively they exist purely to speed up our processing. So they may be a series of um, constant values that, we, that may save us some computational um, time. So we may, may in fact have, like, say, a sign lookup table. So instead of having to calculate sign during runtime, we can simply grab a value out of a lookup table may have a lookup table simply of translations from one form to another. So you may have an example where you might have an analog to digital converter reading voltage values and simply converting them to digital tokens and then you might have a lookup table that converts that digital token back to its original voltage value. So you can use lookup tables to save you a lot of computational mathematical sort of um, cycles inside your processor. So I've got here an example of a KCHAR lookup table which simply has a string of characters, and these string of characters actually represent a 4x4 four four keypad. So a keypad, top line of the keypad was 123A, and the second line was 456B, third line was 789C, the last line was then um, 0 dot and hash. So these were the, 
the actual um, characters that are on the keypad and therefore once you worked out which row and which column was actually triggered you can simply go to this lookup table and simply grab the character out and print that character to the screen. So it made life a lot easier. So you can either describe a lookup table in a logical form, so in the form that clearly sort of represents what you want it to do. So in this example, of it, because they represented the characters on the actual keypad, I represented it as a string of characters. They may in fact represent actual numbers that you need to convert from one form to another, so the lookup table can in fact be a list of bytes. So it depends on the form that makes more logical sense to whatever you're doing to sort of define how you describe that lookup table. Okay, we can have variables that are static or dynamic. Generally, you should have static variables. Generally, you should have variables that are a predefined size when you start the program. So when you write your program, you should have a good idea of how big a variable is going to be, and then you should allocate the memory space to hold that variable. So even if you don't know how big it's going to be, you really want to allocate the maximum amount of space that a variable can get, and then you want to check to make sure the variable doesn't exceed it. Okay, or you can effectively use a structure that we already have at our disposal which can be dynamically shrunk and made bigger. So we can actually use a stack. So if you don't really know how big your variables are going to be, you can always use a stack. Push them on the stack, pull them off when you're finished. So I've given an example here of where I've got a statically defined variable which is of size 200. Okay. So I've turned on the initialized, or basically initialized a serial device again. I've simply loaded accumulator with zero. So accumulator A in, in this case is going to be my counter to keep track of how many bytes I've actually put into my buffer. I then load the X register to point to the start of my buffer. I then JSR to get char. So get char is a subroutine that will actually grab a single character from the keyboard and return it in accumulator B. So I simply get that value back through accumulator B. I store that into the location of X. I increment X and I increment A. So therefore, X points to the next location of my buffer. Accumulator A is keeping track of the total number of bytes. I then compare accumulator A with 200. If it's not equal to, then I simply exit. Sorry, if it's, sorry, if it's not equal to, I simply loop back. But if it is equal to 200, then I exit. So it is this check in that computer accumulator A, which is keeping track to make sure that I don't exceed the 200 bytes in that buffer. And then of course I go back in another character and I keep filling it up, so it's basically going to force me to fill in 200 characters. I could also have another termination in there, say if a particular character was appeared then I terminate that loop also. But this is just making sure that I don't exceed the actual size of my data, so I don't exceed the 200 bytes that I've allocated for that particular buffer. So I've got another example here where I've actually loaded up. So I haven't actually defined a variable here. I've just simply pointed it to the start of my RAM, which is at 2,000. I'm simply doing a get char, simply storing that value into 2,000, and simply incrementing x, comparing it against the carriage return. If it's the carriage return, I simply exit. If it's not the carriage return, I go back and I keep grabbing them. So in this case here, there is no check. Okay, this is a bad example of actually... Um, not checking the amount of space. So first thing is I haven't actually defined a variable to say how big I want it to be, so I haven't really thought about it beforehand. I haven't got any checking mechanism here to ensure that I don't exceed the total amount of capacity that I can actually store in, and basically I just simply enter characters until I hit a carriage return. So it's basically a dynamic variable, but you know I've got no control over how big or how, how small it can be. Okay, I should really be checking, I should really have alloc allocated a certain amount of space and be checking the amount of space to ensure that I don't exceed over it. If I had some variables defined in my RAM start section, then this would actually overwrite them. So that's why it's very important that you define all the variables and then you use those variables when you're using um, storing values. You actually store into particular va variables and you ensure you keep track of how s the size of the amount of data you've stored to ensure you don't exceed that storage container and you don't start overwriting other variables inside your memory map. But this example here gives you an example of effectively load, reading characters in until we hit a carriage return. So it hasn't really done a very, hasn't done it in a very clever way to ensure that we don't have data corruption. So this is really hasn't 
ensured that our code's going to be robust. So in this example here, it's dynamic that the amount of space we store can increase or decrease. I guess if you've, this is the only variable you're using, this I guess it doesn't really matter. So as long as you don't exceed the 4K space that you've got in the RAM, this would probably work, but it's always best to check how much data you've actually stored to ensure you don't exceed the total amount of storage you have at your disposal. Okay, so having written a piece of code, how do we go about debugging our code? So when our code's running on our microcontroller, we want to effectively be able to debug it some way. So there are many different approaches that we can use. We can use you know, in-circuit emulators, we can use ROM monitor systems, we can use breakpoints, we can use background debuggers, we can use JTAGs, we can use logic analyzers. And one other one I didn't mention here is we can also use simulators as well. So you can actually simulate your code to see how it functions. You can look at the registers as it's running and you can see exactly how the code will function in a virtual environment. So the first one I'm talking about here is in-circuit emulator. So the in-circuit in emulator used to be a very popular method of debugging embedded systems. The in-circuit in emulator was basically a device that consisted of two components. It consisted of a host component and it consisted of a replica of the actual microcontroller that you're trying to debug, so to speak. So what we had is we had a emulator running on the host that emulated the particular microcontroller. So the computer ran the emulator, and then we had a cable coming out of the back of the computer with a replicator, basically a replication of the microcontroller on it. So you simply stick that micro microcontroller model, so to speak, inside your circuit, and there was numerous wires coming out of that little plug-in that you'd plug into your circuit, and those wires would go back to the computer, and therefore the actual, I guess, the replica of the microcontroller, the pins on that would actually read the pins inside the circuit. Those pin values would go back to the computer. The computer would then interpret those pin values, run it through the emulator, and then pump back, drive back the pins on that little replica replication again. So it would actually work out what the actual output output should be driven to and simply drive those values back to that little box that you or the little thing that looked like your chip that you plugged into your circuit. So the emulator obviously attempts to completely replace the microcontroller, allowing the user the ability inside the emulator to simply stop the emulator, look at the register set, get a good idea of exactly what's happening. And the beauty was that it was actually sitting inside the circuit and you could see how the microcontroller interacted with the rest of the circuit. So the user had access to all the data provided on the inputs of the ICE and it could trace the flow of data. So you could trace the flow and how data moved around inside the microcontroller and you could see how, how your program worked perfectly inside the, um, the ICE. The benefits of the ICE included it was able to insert the debugger into the actual circuit and debug programs in the actual application situation. So you're actually able to stick it in the real life situation and see how it interacted, how the processor interacted with the other components on that board allowed the programmer the ability to debug microcontrollers which do not contain a built-in debugger. So these were the great benefits of an ICE, okay, but like all things, it had bad things as well, had bad side of, to it as well. So the use of ICE for debugging purposes is no longer worthwhile for the following reasons. Microcontroller, modern-day microcontrollers contain numerous pins Okay, at an extremely high density. So um, our processor has 144 pins. Okay, so having a processor with 144 pins effectively would require you to have a cable of 144 wires going back to the computer. And then the emulator being able to interpret all those 144 lines and being able to drive back the resi desired results in a quick sort of fashion, which it really can't do. So the other thing is the architecture of modern-day processors is extremely difficult to emulate in real time. We have you know, high-speed multipliers, we have high-speed um, functional blocks inside a, micro, inside a microcontroller that modern-day computers cannot compete with. So even if it is a really, really fast computer, you can't get the data back down that wire to the computer, have the computer generate a desired result and pump that result back to that plug-in ICE quick enough for it to be the same as if you had the real microcontroller in there. So as I said, many modern day processes contain pipelines, structured pipelines, multiple buses, and basically it's very difficult to imp 
emulate something that runs that quickly. And of course, dead delays caused by the emulator create more problems in debugging the system, so you don't know whether in fact it's the ICE that's generated those problems or whether in fact it's your code. So the whole idea of debugging is trying to remove the unknowns and not try to introduce more unknowns. So in this case, we introduce another unknown because we really don't know whether the ICE is causing the problem or whether it's our code. So we try and limit it by just not using an ICE at all. So connect, connecting the target or the emulator to the actual ICE is difficult because you've got those 144 wires, so to speak, coming out of that unit, and it's just difficult to make a cable that big. And, and having 144 wires coming out of something that's, you know, um, roughly about 2 centimetres by 2 centimetres is almost impossible to do. So it's virtually impossible to make a ICE plug-in that would actually replace our processor that we're using. So for that reason, ICE debuggers are now a thing of the past, since many processors now contain on-chip debuggers. But there may be situations where you're using very small scale, very slow speed processors, and an ICE may in fact be available. So it makes sense to actually know what an ICE actually is. But one of the things that a lot of microcontrollers currently have now is they have ROM monitor systems, which effectively you can have a built-in debugger. So it's a chunk of code that sits on your microcontroller that you can use to do debugging. So a lot of modern day microcontrollers will have debuggers and you can use those debuggers to trace through your code. So the monitor communicates with the user through a terminal connection via an RS-232 interface to the microcontroller. So you hook up your computer to the microcontroller through the RS-232 and then you communicate with the monitor either using a terminal that simply um, the monitor inside the microcontroller may interpret your commands directly that you type in the terminal or in fact it may be a binary monitor which means you need a host program running on your PC that then communicates to this serial monitor. Okay, So the monitor programs provide a prompt on the screen with many useful instructions built in functions that aid the development and testing of your source code. Okay, processor The monitor allows a host computer to communicate with the processor so it may be communicating via directly through a terminal or it may be communicating through a host specifically built program. Okay. So during our development and testing of programs, the debugger is used to load, execute and debug the source code. So loading your code up onto the microcontroller is facilitated by the built-in ROM monitor. So when you actually upload your code in the lab, it is in fact the serial monitor that's running on the DAP 9 s 12 x that is in fact facilitating the mechanism of loading and running your code. So when the debugging of course is complete and you're pretty happy your code works perfectly, you can in fact remove the monitor if so desired. So if you really want to free up that space and get a little bit more of flash, you can remove the monitor and then put your code to occupy that extra bit of flash if you so desire. So monitor is usually good during the debugging and the testing phases. And once you're finished and you're pretty, pretty, pretty sure that your code's working perfectly, you can then nuke out the ROM monitor and simply put your code in its place. Another mechanism that a lot of microcontrollers have is referred to as a background debugger. And like the name suggests, it's actually a background piece of hardware that actually sits in parallel with the microcontroller. So there's actually some dedicated hardware on the processor to facilitate, facilitate the background debugging. It will actually sit there and you, while the program's actually running on your target controller, on the actual microcontroller that you're using, when your program's running you can actually trace the, look at the memory, you can look at the register sets all while it's running. So a background debug module is very useful for just seeing how, how your code is running while, while, while it's actually in its real environment. So you simply hook a cable into your target and then using a BDM pod, you can actually communicate with the processor while it's running okay, without actually interfering with it. So you can actually use um, the background debugging circuit inside your microcontroller to actually see what's happening. So using the BDM, so using the BDM module or BDM pod, it is possible to read and write to the memory of the target system, view and modify registers in the target system, and also trace a single instruction at a time. So you can actually stop the system running and you can simply go trace one instruction at a time to see exactly what is happening inside your code. So the BDM setup consists of a single wire connection between the BDM pod and the target system. 
and the connection is made to the background pin on each of the MCUs. So generally, it's a single wire connection. Biddy and Pod will have a BGN, BGND pin, and your target will have BG, BGND pin as well. And simply that single wire is allowed to facilitate the whole process of the background debugger. A mechanism that sort of replaced the background debugger, or effectively re definitely replaced the ICE, is the JTAG. It's made by a consortium of companies called the Joint Test Action Group, and that's why it's called JTAG. It's, com it's an IEEE standard, so its common name is IEEE 1149.1, and it's called Standard Test Access Port and Boundary Scanned Architecture, so that's the real name for it. And it allows for easy programming and debugging of target platforms. Okay, so you can actually cascade many different JTAG capable devices together. So there's three pins that we use. There's TMS, TC, TCK, and TDI and TDO. So TMS is one of the control lines. TCK is our clock line. TDI is our input line. And TDO is our output. So it's a single wire um, serial connection. So daisy chaining them together, we simply TDI goes into the first one, TDO of the first device goes into TDI of the second one. So effectively, you can pulse this data through all those devices. So one of the good things about the JTAG is every JTAG device contains four dedicated JTAG pins the TMS, TCK, TDO, and TDI. Every pin on the device is connected to a single bit buffer. Okay, so what what happens is we effectively we can send a command into one of these JTAG devices and we can tell it to simply read the pins. So what it will do is it simply each pin on the actual processor will connect to a single bit memory element. Okay, and we can actually and each one of these single bit memory elements are all connected together in a serial fashion. So what we can say we we can say we want to read the pins and send it the JTAG command to read the pins and then what will happen in a serial fashion is all the pin values will actually come out in a serial stream back to the computer. So we can effectively at one point in time say, hey, sample the pins now and it will sample all the pins on our microcontroller and simply send back that sample pin numbers as, as a binary string. So therefore we could load that binary string into a emulator, so to speak. Emulator could then process all those input pins and then maybe generate some corresponding output pins. So therefore, we just simply send back a command to say we want to write to the JTAG registers, and therefore we send back a binary string, a binary string that's of length for the number of pins that we have in our process, and then we simply load those, those bit registers with the particular values that we want, and then those values are actually driven out onto the pins. Okay, so we can actually, using JTAG, we can read all the pins on a processor, we can drive all the pins on a processor, and that's why JTAG is very useful for programming or debugging our code because we can see exactly as our code is running we can read all the output pins so we can see exactly how our process is driving the outside world we can also use our JTAG for programming our our board because what we can do is because some of those pins are actually our address and data and control lines we can actually using JTAG we can actually drive those various pins so that we can effectively write to our memory locations so in effectively we can drive our read write pin to say we want to do a write we can drive the first address of the memory location we run write on and we can drive our data bus for that particular value so we can actually use JTAG to in fact write to anywhere in our memory map we can also use JTAG to read any value inside our memory map as well so it's really good for debugging really good for loading our code and it's a great little um, Basically, it's a great little um, mechanism that's been developed. It's pretty much revolutionized debugging as far as microcontrollers are concerned. Okay, another great little mechanism that we can have access to is, of course, a logic analyzer. So a logic analyzer is a, is a box that looks very similar to an oscilloscope. However, it allows us to monitor many, many wires at the same time. So basically, oscilloscopes were great, okay, but things have just got a lot more complicated since the olden days. So generally in the olden days, we had a oscilloscope was more than adequate because we generally only want to keep track of, you know, one, two, or three, three lines at the most to see exactly what was happening on 
on those systems. So when it comes to doing analog analog electronics, uh, Crow is is very useful. But when it comes to doing digital electronics, a Crow is very limited. Okay, so one of the problems with oscilloscopes is it has limitations, and these limitations are that for an oscilloscope to work, a waveform must be repetitive for it to be displayed properly. So it must be a periodic signal to have proper trigger points, and then you can see it clearly on the screen. And of course, oscilloscopes are limited to only a small number of inputs, with four being you know, the largest number of inputs found on an oscilloscope today. So generally, you're limited by the number of inputs that you can actually monitor at the same time. And when it comes to digital electronics, you need to monitor a whole heap of lines at the same time. Well, if you're doing a microcontroller circuit, you need to monitor a hell of a lot of lines at the same time. So in order to successfully analyze a digital circuit that's built around an 8-bit microprocessor, so we're not even talking about the 16-bit one we use, but if you want to look at an 8-bit microprocessor, you'd require a device that had enough inputs capable of monitoring 8 data lines, 16 address lines, and several control lines at the same time. So we're really getting up to a very large sort of number of inputs around about the range of 32 inputs so not to speak not to mention if you wanted to say monitor some other lines that were on our circuit that you know may in fact impact on how a microcontroller works so you can very quickly you know exceed the four inputs an oscilloscope provides because we would need a hell of a lot of inputs to monitor a digital microcontroller based circuit efficiently so that's when a logic analyzer actually comes in comes in a basic logic analyzer consists of many, many probes. So these could be little alligator clip probes, or in fact you can get little connectors that you can plug in over the top of your chip, which then touch all the pins of your, of your microcontroller, so therefore it makes all the connections for you to all the various input-output, data lines, you know, address lines, and so forth for you. So basically we've got a pod that allows the connection to our physical circuit, or our physical device, and then we have a cable that simply connects back into the logic analyzer itself. So we have the probes to the logic analyzer and of course we have the logic analyzer itself. So each digital signal can either give us a zero or one. It's connected to a single separate channel on the logic analyzer. So we have you know a, a channel for each individual bit line. Okay. The logic analyzer continually samples each one of these channels and writes the data to its internal memory until the particular trigger event causes it to stop. So it simply keeps logging it in a circular buffer, keeps track of, say, the last, you know, four or five seconds of samples, and then when a particular event happens, so you might be looking for, you know, a particular, you know, an interrupt to occur or some particular digital line to go to a particular value, when that event takes place, you then stop the logic analyzer, and therefore you can see the values. You can then trace back exactly what happened up leading up to that event. So when it comes to doing logic analyzers, you can represent those channels in various ways. One thing you can do is you can group the channels together. So if, the, so if say, you know, these eight channels represent the data bus, you can group those eight channels together into a data bus and therefore you can actually show the 8-bit value that would be on the data bus as either, you know, binary number or as a hexadecimal number so you can see exactly what the data is that's flying through around your circuit. You can do the same thing with the address bus and control buses to group them together so you can see the actual address value that might be requested at a particular point in time. The other way that you can do it is if, if you don't actually want to see the values but you want to see the relationship between one signal line and the next, you can actually then use a timing diagram representation. So you can actually see them as timing diagrams and see exactly what, you know, how the relationship between one signal and the next sort of shows up. So you can see if you've got code to say do real-time synchronization is simply delay for a certain amount of time, you can look at that on the timing diagram to see if in fact your code is delaying for the right amount of time. If it's not, then you can go back and fix it. So it depends on what you're trying to get out of the data, whether you actually want to see the real values or whether you want to see the relationships. You can either see them as a table of values or as a timing diagram. Okay, so both an oscilloscope and a logic analyzer, as I said, rely on a trigger event Okay, so on an oscilloscope, the signal can only be viewed after a trigger has occurred. On the logic analyzer, however, you can view the data before and after a particular trigger event. So you can actually set the logic analyzer that after event takes place, it samples for you know, a certain number of seconds after that event. So therefore, you can see the data around a particular event. So a logic analyzer is really good for seeing what happened leading up to a particular event and what happened 
as a result of that event. So it's good for debugging because you can see the data and you can see the address lines. You can see what your processor was doing before an event took place and then you can see what your processor was doing after the event took place. So Logic Analyzer is a really great tool to use. So I've shown some pictures here of the Logic Analyzer on the left and a series of probes that hook into the Logic Analyzer on the right. So, like normal, should you require any further assistance, please do not hesitate to ask your demonstrator, post the question on the forum, email me, the convener, or make an appointment to see me, but please make sure all your questions get answered.